My talk uh, will be on the radio counterparts of neutron star mergers, and in particular how we're going after them with uh, LOFAR, which is the, stands for the Low Frequency Array. So I'll provide like a brief you know, introduction about the subject before diving into how we're using LOFAR to, to go after those radio counterparts. When I use the term neutron star mergers, I'm really referring to two different types of systems. Uh, I'm sure many of you in the room will be familiar with them, but I'll just provide a, an overview just to make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm really referring to uh, systems that contain either a black hole and a neutron star or a, a double neutron star system or, or a binary neutron star system. Now over time, uh, these um, objects in, in these binary systems will um, move closer and closer together through gravitational wave radiation until ultimately um, the closest point of contact um, where we have you know, the so-called co point of coalescence or, or merger time. Um, so I'll use both of those terms interchangeably. Um, now there are two types of, okay, so the keyword, that is what I have to use. Um, so uh, there are two types of prompt indicators that tell us that uh, a neutron star merger has just occurred. Uh, the first one, um, and, and longest used one you could say, is uh, a short gamma ray burst. And this is caused by a relativistic jet that's launched when uh, either a, uh, by a double neutron star system merges, or possibly also when a black hole and a neutron star coalesces. We're not so sure yet whether that's, you know, th that's yet to be confirmed. Um, and so these are typically detected by um, uh, gamma ray burst detectors um, in orbit around Earth. Um, and these have been online detecting short gamma ray bursts for the last few decades now. And steadily they've uh, built up a sample of, of hundreds of short gamma ray bursts. There's a second type of indicator, a newer one, um, and that's through the actual detection of those gravitational waves I talked about earlier. Um, these are detected by gravitational wave detectors. Um, and again, this is kind of like a, a new um, era uh, or a new kind of a field um, of astronomy because it's only recently that these detectors have been turned on and um, actually detecting these systems through their gravitational waves. And so anytime uh, one of these uh, mergers are identified through either of these types of indicators, the corresponding observatory will alert the astronomy community as to what they've just seen. And then astronomers who are interested in these sort of systems can um, determine whether or not they'd like to point their telescope of choice at that system to uh, see if they can catch any associated EM emission. So what might uh, these astronomers be looking for? Well, there's actually a whole wide variety of different types of counterparts uh, across the EM spectrum. Um, this figure kind of just shows a, a summary of what those might include. Some of them have already been previously detected, and I'll talk about that. Some of them are, are kind of more, um, ha have been uh, postulated, but, but yet to be uh, confirmed. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we have a, a large sample of GRBs that have been uh, detected. So um, with it, uh, a large sample of them have also had detected X-ray emission, um, either X-ray emission caused by the, the central engine that uh, remains post-merger, um, that the so-called plateau uh, that will come back up towards the end of my talk, um, but um, um, mostly to do with uh, the actual synchrotron counterpart um, that, uh, uh, or afterglow that arises post-merger. And I'll talk more about that in detail in a few slides. Um, uh, a large portion, but a slightly smaller fraction, uh, is also detected in the optical, so the optical uh, afterglow. Um, and then an even smaller fraction is detected in the radio. So in fact, only a handful of those hundreds of short gamma ray bursts have an associated radio uh, counterpart that's been observed. Um, it's also worth mentioning, you'll, you'll see I've put a tilde and a check mark beside uh, the kilonova here, and that's because um, uh, in, until recently, uh, until the gravitational wave detectors were detecting neutron star mergers, there was only really one case of a kind of example of kilonova being detected. This was back in 2013, and we were really limited in you know, the, the amount of data that was collected on that particular object. So why is that the case for kilonova, and why is that the case for uh, radio afterglows? Um, it really has to do with the distances out to which short gamma ray bursts are detected. So the median redshift, or, or the mean uh, redshift out to which short gamma ray bursts are detected is about a redshift of one, right? And these counterparts are relatively faint. Um, and so that really makes uh, detecting, you know, their counterparts challenging. And that's why um, the uh, prospect of being able to detect these systems with gravitational wave detectors um, was so exciting because uh, these detectors are not as sensitive. They're only going to be detecting the gravitational wave events that are 
uh, nearest by. We're talking about a horizon of about 100 megaparsecs compared to you know, a redshift of one. Um, and so if you're interested in finding the counterparts of these things, um, your probably best bet is to trigger on gravitational waves rather than uh, short gamma ray bursts. Um, and so this promise was delivered with the detection eventually of uh, GW170817. This has now become a household name in, in this field. Um, this refers to the, the first gravitational wave detection of a binary neutron star merger. So this figure, there's a lot going on here, but this kind of uh, summarizes uh, very well, I think, the kind of scale of the follow-up effort that ensued across the, the EM spectrum. So uh, uh, the, the vertical notches indicate any time an alert was sent out by the corresponding, um, uh, 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 by, by some observatory in the corresponding uh, wavelength um, uh, about an observation that um, ha had taken place. Um, but more importantly, the solid horizontal lines and the circles denote when a detection of a counterpart was made, um, uh, as well as, you know, um, for, for how long uh, the counterpart was actually observable in the corresponding band. And so the, the big thing to note here is that there was, you know, a solid line or a detection uh, across the EM spectrum. Um, so for a single event, for 170817, you have the detection of gravitational waves, you have the detection of a short gamma ray burst, and then you had that... Um, uh, afterglow, that synchrotron afterglow uh, detectable in the x-rays, in the optical. You had a nice example of a, a kilonova, uh, and then yes, uh, finally a nice detection in the radio. Um, and so uh, what, what was really uh, different here is because of its proximity, um, we were able to sample that light curve to unprecedented detail. So this is what, um, uh, this is what the, oops, oh, I think I switched up my slides, sorry about that. Um, Okay, yeah, so uh, uh, essentially I'll be focusing in this talk for, um, uh, I'll, I'll be focusing on the radio mission that's associated with uh, neutron star mergers, and you'll see that I've highlighted two different kind of categories of radio emission. So um, you have uh, what I would categorize, categorize as prompt emission. This is related to coherent radio emission um, that might be associated with neutron star mergers. It's worth noting that this was not um, uh, possible to be probed for 170817 in particular. Um, that's because the, the first uh, radio telescope that was on source um, was 30 minutes post-merger, so not really able to probe most of um, those uh, related um, models. Now I'll be focusing on the prompt emission towards the end of my talk. For the first part of my talk, I'll be focusing on that late time incoherent uh, synchrotron afterglow. Um, and indeed that was what was observed for 170817. Now, the incoherent uh, afterglow um, is caused by fast-moving merger ejecta uh, plowing into the ambient medium to produce this shock, and that triggers the synchrotron uh, radio afterglow. Uh, now, this afterglow is actually broadband. It's observable from X-rays all the way down to radio waves. Um, and there are actually two components, you could say, to this afterglow. The, the, the primary one is that that's caused by the jet. So this is the relativistic jet that's responsible for the observed short gamma ray burst. Um, and this is the afterglow that has been observed for uh, short gamma ray bursts as well as for 170817. Studying that afterglow can allow you to probe information about uh, the structure of the jet, the, the jet's composition, uh, the total energy of the jet, and importantly, the viewing geometry of, uh, of the system. Um, now, there's a, a slightly uh, lesser known uh, component, you could say, of, of the afterglow, and this actually has to do with the dynamical ejecta. Um, and what this refers to is the, the neutron-rich matter that's ejected, that's responsible for that kilonova emission. And I realize now that I hadn't explained briefly what the kilonova actually refers to. So basically, when this neutron-rich matter is um, ejected, it's actually going to undergo these uh, radioactive uh, processes that are um, going to basically are the sites for um, the production of heavy elements in the universe. And the counterpart that's associated with uh, that, that's observed in the optical and infrared, is called a kilonova. But this merger ejected too is going to, similarly as the jet, plow into the ambient medium, medium to produce this long-lasting synchrotron afterglow. Now, this has yet to be observed. It's even fainter than uh, the afterglow that's caused by the jet, and so it makes it even more challenging to detect. But the reason why I wanted to bring it up here is that I do think that it's um, uh, probably a counterpart that we can look forward to hopefully detecting in, in the coming years, in the coming runs. 
um, and will be particularly important um, at uh, radio frequencies and, and possibly at lower radio frequencies, which is the regime I'm interested in. But for the purposes of this talk, I'll really be focusing on the, the component, the afterglow component caused by, by the jet. <clears throat> Now, the, the afterglow um, of uh, the jet is, is, is very complex. Um, so there's a lot going on in this uh, uh, spectrum uh, that's shown here. Um, and the point that I'm trying to convey really with this slide is that it's, it's very complex. It can be described by three spectral breaks. So starting on the right hand side, you have um, the electron cooling frequency. This is the frequency above which uh, electrons cool rapidly. Uh, it's less important in the radio band. It's, it's more important um, in the X-ray band, for instance. Um, so we don't worry about it as much um, in the radio. Uh, the middle uh, spectral uh, break corresponds to the characteristic electron frequency. And then the break on the left-hand side corresponds to the synchrotron self-absorption frequency. So that is particularly important for uh, the radio band um, because if you observe at frequencies below the, uh, the absorption uh, frequency, you're going to have a lot of trouble detecting your, your uh, counterpart. Um, now there's a lot of rich physics stored into this afterglow, and I've listed uh, what I think are you know some of the major ones on this slide here. It's a non-exhaustive list, um, but you know certain macrophysical parameters like the the total energy um, uh, can provide information about the circummerger uh, density, uh, but also important information about uh, the jet geometry. You know what the viewing angle of the system is, what the opening angle of the jet is, um, as well as certain microphysical parameters like you know the the distribution the energy distribution of the electrons, um, the synchrotron electrons. Now if you want you know, any hope of being able to actually uh, decode the information that's, that's stored there, you need to observe the afterglow, right? So let's say you take um, uh, your telescope of choice, observing at frequency nu, at time t post-merger, the flux f uh, sub nu that you'll observe is described um, by that equation that, that's shown there. Um, so really the flux that you will measure is going to depend on where you fall, which spectral arm uh, you land on. And you'll notice that uh, you know, beta is going to be dependent on that, but alpha is also going to be dependent on which spectral arm you land on. So there's a lot of potential here and room for degeneracy. And so if you want any hope of being able to you know, um, correctly um, uh, decode the information that's stored into this afterglow, you're going to need to sample your afterglow um, at a wide range of frequencies and at high temporal cadence. And ho hopefully that's a, a enough kind of background information to convey that this really just was not possible uh, prior to the detection of, of gravitational waves. Short gamma ray bursts are just too far out um, in the un universe to be able to um, gain a detailed sampling of, of uh, this afterglow. And so this is a, the example light curve for 170817. You'll see that it's, it's, it's sampled across, uh, um, you know, temporally very well and across a wide range of frequencies. Of course, I'm just showing the radio observations. Of course, we have um, information from x-rays all the way down uh, to, to radio. Um, and so with, for the singular event, we were able to gain an understanding of what the orientation um, um, uh, looked like. This helped to break a degeneracy um, in uh, our constraints of uh, H0, right? Because there's a distance degeneracy, um, uh, distance and, and I guess uh, you could say power, um, uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, degeneracy in the, the gravitational wave analysis of, of H0. So this allowed um, us to get an understanding, a better understanding of the uh, viewing geometry of the system. Um, okay, so hopefully I've convinced everyone that 170817 was, was very interesting. I just looked at it from you know the radio perspective, but there are lots of other reasons why uh, gravitational wave merger event counterparts are, are interesting. But this is only one event, right? It's worth noting that we've had a whole other observing run since the detection of 170817 and have not have yet to find another EM counterpart. And so, you know, there are, there are many open questions. I've listed what I think are some of the major ones, but again, it's not it's a non-exhaustive list. Um, but some important questions are, you know, we still don't know what um, a black hole neutron star merger counterpart will look like. We don't know whether they're going to produce a, a relativistic jet. We don't know if that will look similar to for example, what we saw with 170817. And the only way we're really going to be able to address those questions if we, is if we detect more EM counterparts. The challenge is that 
um, <clears throat> gravitational wave merger events are famously or infamously poorly localized, right? So we're all used to seeing um, these huge banana-shaped localization areas. This is a, a, um, an, a summary of the localization areas for gravitational wave merger events from the first two observing runs. You'll see that 170817 in the yellow towards the middle there is, is quite an anomaly, right? Its localization areas is a lot smaller than, than the other events shown here. And that really facilitated uh, EM follow-up, right? So it was uh, rather um, uh, relatively easy to detect um, the uh, EM counterpart in such a, a small, relatively small localization area. Um, but we're not always going to be so lucky. This event was very close by. That also facilitated the detection. It was about 40 megaparsecs away. Um, so really, if you want any chance of being able to catch future events, you need to rely on telescopes that have high survey speeds, um, but also without sacrificing in sensitivity, right? Because these counterparts are, are rather faint. And so this is where um, I think LOFAR um, uh, can be a really powerful tool. Um, and this is due to its uh, wide field of view, as I'll, uh, as I'll come to show, and, and its high sensitivity. So LOFAR is a, um, is a radio interferometer. Its headquarters are in the Netherlands and in, in Europe, uh, though it has longer baselines uh, through stations uh, throughout um, Europe. For the purposes of this work, um, uh, we just make use of uh, the, the Dutch stations, and we use the high band antennae. So we, uh, our observations are centered at about 150 megahertz. <clears throat> So LOFAR has been following up on gravitational wave events since the first observing run. Um, so this is an example of uh, a LOFAR mosaic created using um, eight simultaneous LOFAR beams, so a single LOFAR observation. Uh, and this is covering the field of, uh, I think this was the, the first uh, binary black hole um, that was detected. And you can see it does a pretty good job of covering a, a large fraction of its uh, localization area. So this is about uh, coverage to about 60 square degrees. Obviously, you have a drop off in sensitivity at the outer edges of the, the beam pattern. Um, what about 170817? So I described that, you know, it's a really nice event. I would have liked it a lot more had it occurred in the northern hemisphere, right? LOFAR is in, in the northern hemisphere, and the declination here is minus 23 or so. Now, nonetheless, the kind of feeling at the time was like, you know, if you had a telescope and it could point to uh, 170817, you're probably going to do that if you could. And so the, the feeling was no different with uh, the team um, uh, at LOFAR. So uh, we uh, obtained some, some observations, uh, and then the challenge was actually trying to actually reduce that data um, obtained at such low relative elevations. So we, um, uh, we um, got our like in-house uh, radio interferometry experts. This is when I started my PhD, so I was just learning the dark arts of radio interferometry. Um, so I, I was uh, lucky enough that they didn't throw me in the deep end and have me reduce this data myself as my first data set, which I'm very thankful for. Um, so anyway, they ended up squeezing out this, this image, which, you know, I, I don't know if there are radio astronomers in the room, but um, I think it's pretty lovely considering all the, the, um, the challenges associated. Um, and I think it still holds the record of being the deepest image, uh, low far image ever obtained at such low relative elevations. Okay, that, that sounds good and all, but how does that actually like relate to the science that we're trying to do? So if we compare it to the extrapolated light curve for 170817 um, uh, down to, to low far frequencies, you know, we're, we're off by a solid order of magnitude or so, you know, those, those downward facing uh, um, uh, triangles. Um, but what we do show um, is what we would have been able to obtain had the event occurred at more favorable declination. So basically, you know, in the northern hemisphere. Um, and we, we demonstrate that, you know, we would have been in a good position to be able to uh, potentially make a detection or place a limit on that su synchrotron self-absorption um, break um, and possibly even distinguish between the competing models at the time. <clears throat> now, to, to take this a step further in the paper that we wrote up on, on these observations, um, you know, as I mentioned, 170817 was uh, rather close by. We wanted to see what, um, you know, what we might expect at low far frequencies uh, for different kind of uh, model, um, model options for a 170817 like event, but placed a more typical distance, it's distances, so like 100 megaparsecs, a more typical uh, environment, uh, a density. And these are, you know, some, some uh, uh, light curve predictions or, or model predictions. And we demonstrate once again that for an already localized event, placing a, a single low far beam and observing for eight hours, we would, we would be in a good position to be able to distinguish between models. But this is like a particular um, 
uh, kind of uh, observing situation, right? The whole point of LOFAR, uh, I think, its, its niche is that it has a large instantaneous field of view. So two weeks after the detection of 170817, there was this, this detection, albeit at low significance, of a, a black hole neutron star merger. We still had some time. Um, and I think the observatory was very uh, excited. I think everyone is excited. You know, we just got a binary neutron star merger. Let's finish off O2 with a, a, binary, a black hole neutron star merger counterpart. Eventually, the, the uh, uh, event was retracted, but we wanted to use this field anyway to establish our um, uh, observation uh, and data reduction strategy as well as our um, transient search strategy. So I'll walk you through um, what, this, what this all looked like. So you can see this localization area is like much more typical of what you expect for gravitational wave events. We're talking about a localization area of like 2,000 square degrees, so, so very large. There, there's more, uh, there, there are more contours at the other, uh, um, uh, at the other side of, of the globe, which is not shown here. So we ended up making this uh, uh, LOFAR footprint, which you see here. Uh, through the use of 48 LOFAR beans. So this was constructed um, using, uh, I think it was, yeah, six pointings, um, or, or eight pointings, rather. Um, each, each pointing uh, consisted of uh, six um, instantaneous LOFAR beams, and those are denoted, the core of those LOFAR beams are denoted by those blue circles that you see there. Now, obviously, these are, you know, overlapping beams, and so you end up having further coverage out to the edges of your beam pattern, and this is shown by the uh, dashed lines. But at the core of your... Um, of each uh, beam, um, if you count all of those up, you end up having a coverage um, out to 300 square degrees, right? So that's 300 square degrees probed of unique sky, and that's like a really large amount uh, of data, especially radio data. We're talking about like several tens of, of terabytes of raw data alone. So the, the strategy is to observe um, this event um, uh, within a week post-merger, and this is just to obtain your reference observation. This is because you don't actually expect a radio counterpart at such low frequencies that early on. And so the idea is then you take your science observations, in this case one month and three months post-merger, and the idea is you're looking for a radio source that appears in those science um, observations, the one month and three months post-merger observations, that is not present in that one week reference observation. Now, as I mentioned, this is a, a lot of data to process, right? And so we had to be, you know, make some um, concessions in our uh, reduction strategy. So tens of terabytes alone in terms of raw data, and then you, you know, double that, triple that um, when you start reducing the data. And so we had to be quite selective how we, uh, about how we were going to go about that. So we ended up kind of opting for a shallow uh, uh, kind of a calibration, I guess you could say. Um, so we just use the standard LOFAR pipelines, and we produced um, an image for each one of these beams. So we have 48 LOFAR beams uh, times three epochs, so about 150 um, fields to, to image. So this is an example of, of one of those beams imaged. And you'll really see the effects of not having uh, calibrated carefully. So in particular, not having accounted for um, direction-dependent effects, so we say. Uh, that, that refers to really just correcting for ion the ionosphere. Um, which will, will have, um, will, which will be um, more important to take care of when you observe uh, at lower radio frequencies. And so the result of not really having corrected for that properly is apparent by those side lobes around those bright sources, right? And so what that results in, or what the, the implications, implications of not having corrected for that is that you end up with a lot of false positives when you eventually do your, your transient search. You end up with um, uh, these side lobes that uh, 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 get picked up as, as spurious uh, false positives. So we had to come up with a bunch of algorithms to, to filter these out. Uh, but ultimately, you know, our um, our uh, our um, uh, like mean uh, sensitivity uh, was about 10 millijanties uh, across all of our uh, our uh, our fields. Now, one of the purposes, uh, in addition to establishing our actual data reduction and search strategy, one of the purposes of, of carrying this all out was to actually establish what the background rate of transient sources is at those radio frequencies, probing those time scales, and at those sensitivities. So this plot shows exactly that. On the left axis, you have essentially the, yeah, the density of transients per square degree. And then uh, on the, the bottom side, uh, on the, uh, the x-axis on the, on the left, you have the time scale probed. We show all the different um, uh, limits that have been placed by, by previous surveys, and our results are shown by those gold stars. 
on the right hand side uh, on the x-axis you have the, the sensitivity so you can see that we're really probing new parts of transient phase space and so it was important for us to establish you know how how common is it to find a radio transient in the kind of parameter space that that we're probing um, so that in the future if you do make a detection uh, you can say whether or not it's likely that that's associated with the gravitational wave merger event and as you can see uh, these are mostly upper limits the the transient um, uh, the transient sky is, is rather uh, quiet um, uh, at low radio frequencies. So uh, that sounds all nice for a, you know, a, a transient, uh, a general kind of transient um, search perspective, but um, you know, how deep, how good is that um, if you bring it back to the main focus of this project, which is you know, gravitational wave counterparts. So if we compare this to those predicted light curves at low far frequencies, we're not, we're, we're again, you know, not really probing the, the, the sensitivity that we need uh, in order to, to be competitive. And so moving on to O3, um, we decided to, to change our strategy. So going into O3, we were going to cover less area. So we were going to conduct a single low far multi-beam observation, uh, but we were going to calibrate it a lot more carefully this time. Uh, we are going to do so using the state-of-the-art um, uh, survey team, uh, the uh, survey team um, reduction pipeline. pipeline. And so uh, I'll just cycle through some of the results from from O3. So in total, we observed three different um, gravitational wave uh, merger events. Uh, out of the three that we observed, this actually remains the only one that uh, ended up not being, um, I guess you could say, retracted during offline analysis. So usually, like if you're not in LIGO, you only get this information two years later, unless you have like some friends in, in the collaboration. Um, so we had to wait for, for a couple of years. Um, but nonetheless, we, we uh, re reduced uh, the data um, just, you know, as we normally would. Um, so uh, this is um, the low far coverage. In the inset, we show low far coverage uh, of this particular event, again, using a single low far multi beam observation. So these are, you know, seven beams in a hexagonal uh, sort of pattern. And at the core of that mosaic, where you're, you know, most sensitive and where you have uniform sensitivity, we're covering about 20 square degrees, over 20 square degrees instantaneously. And if you compare that to this, you know, fairly large localization map, which is quite typical, um, we basically there's a 15% chance that that gravitational wave event, if real, occurred, um, um, is found in our um, or is covered by our, our low far image. Um, so this is what the resulting, very nicely calibrated data set looks like on, on the left. I've already shown the one on the right. Um, and you can see immediately the effects of having calibrated carefully, right? We've gotten rid of those nasty side lobes, except for that, you know, really bright source. There are, those, there are limits to what, what you can achieve, but um, yeah, a, a huge improvement um, to the point where we could actually lower our uh, detection threshold because we don't have to worry about these spurious sources as much. And uh, these are, it's worth noting, comparable integration times. So they're both four hour images. Um, so we're able to actually gain uh, in sensitivity um, uh, in order of magnitude and sensitivity. Um, but we wanted to actually go even deeper than that. So we thought, you know, that, that's really nice. We're getting to the sensitivities that we need, but let's try to aim for sub milijansky levels. And to do that, we just simply doubled our integration time. So instead of observing for four hours, we're going to observe for eight hours. And this is really like kind of the standard um, observing setup and, and um, strategy um, that will also be uh, carrying forward uh, in 04. Uh, so this is the resulting mosaic here. I'm actually not even just showing the core, but I'm showing the, the full extent of the coverage. So, you know, you can do perform your searches out to maybe even 60 um, square degrees, but that core is that 20 square degrees box of like uniform sensitivity. And yeah, we've uh, achieved some Lejansky levels, which, which bodes really well. We, we essentially just need uh, an event to go off in the Northern Hemisphere. So moving on to, or, or looking forward to 04. It's due to commence in uh, March or April 2023. We should be able to look forward to improved localization. So hopefully, you know, those thousand square degree maps are not going to be uh, the norm, but hopefully we'll have some three detector events that will um, have localizations on the order of like 100 square degrees. And such a localization area should allow us to, you know, probe the majority of, uh, or, you know, more than 50% of the localization map, which is quite exciting. Now, the last point is, is a little bit uh, jarring, right? So LOFAR is actually going to be offline uh, starting this month till uh, um, November 2023. And the reason for that is it's uh, undergoing an, an upgrade. 
So there's a silver lining to this, even though that we're, we're going to be missing about half of 04. And the silver lining is that it's undergoing an upgrade, and part of that upgrade will uh, bring a positive uh, new features um, to the uh, rapid response system. So essentially, they're not changing any of the hardware, they're changing uh, the correlator. And what that means, or one of the um, consequences of that, is that uh, the LOFAR will be able to record uh, dual data streams, so multiple data streams at the same time. And I'll uh, talk about exactly what the implications of that are, are for our science. Um, but uh, briefly, the, the implications um, are that we'll be able to um, improve our observations, our triggered observations, to search for prompt, coherent radio counterparts. So this is a bit of a, I'm going to be shifting gears for the rest of my talk. Um, as I mentioned early on, I, um, I would get to coherent radio emission related to neutron star mergers. So um, I'll briefly introduce what that means. Um, so uh, here we're referring to you know, a short duration uh, radio emission on the order of about a, a millisecond coming from outside of our galaxy. This actually meets the definition of a fast radio burst. So I'll be using the term fast radio burst or FRB interchangeably with coherent radio emission. Um, now, uh, there are several models that have been proposed uh, that, to link coherent radio emission with neutron star mergers. And actually many of the models or some of these models predate the discovery of, of FRBs, it's worth noting. So I'll cycle through what are, I think, the representative sort of classes um, of, of models related to FRBs uh, and neutron star mergers. So I'll, I'll do so in order of um, uh, time to merger, I guess you could say. So starting on the far left, you have actual, actually pre-merger models. So these are models that predict the emission of an FRB uh, before the merger has occurred. And many of these um, have to do with uh, magnetospheric interactions of the inspiraling models. There are some that are more exotic than others. Some of them actually just invoke using the gravitational um, wave energy, but this is a bit more exotic. Um, the other, um, the next kind of category of model um, has to do with um, FRBs being emitted um, uh, um, kind of in, in, in connection to the GRB relativistic jet that's launched. So for instance, shocks within the uh, um, relativistic jets. And then the, the classes of models that remain really have to do with the nature and stability of the merger remnant. Uh, so at one extreme, you could end up with a highly unstable uh, neutron star remnant that will inevitably collapse into a black hole because it cannot support itself. Um, and there are some, again, I would say more exotic theories that um, predict that uh, you might get an FRB in the process through no hair theorem. It has to eject, this neutron star has to eject its magnetosphere. And there have been some theories to, that predict that it will, this will produce an FRB in the process. At the other end of uh, the spectrum, you might end up with a more stable neutron star remnant. And um, at this point, you could really invoke whatever your favorite neutron star related uh, FRB model is, right? So we're talking about uh, a highly, is, this remnant's going to be rotating very rapidly, it's going to have a high magnetic field likely. So this meets the definition of a magnetar. And there are several magnetar related FRB models. Um, you can kind of classify them as either rotational, uh, rotationally powered models or magnetically powered models. For the rotational powered, mo powered models, you can think of like pulsar-like emission. For magnetar, uh, magnetically powered models, you can think of like magnetar flares, for instance. <clears throat> okay, so FRBs are, are, are not rare at all, actually. So we see, you know, we, uh, uh, um, uh, from a rates perspective, uh, th there are thousands that go off per sky per day at, at the sensitivity of the Parkes telescope. So these are actually not rare events at all. You might already think that you know, this is clearly not consistent with the rates of, of neutron star mergers, and that's completely true. It's impossible that all of them can be described by neutron star mergers, I think. Um, but the idea here that, that, that we are testing is, you know, can a, a small fraction of them be connected to a, a neutron star merger origin? Now, FRBs um, in recent years have started to be um, uh, localized. So we have the ability now to actually associate FRBs to their uh, host galaxies to which, uh, from which they, they were generated. Um, and uh, so you can actually start using that information about you know, the, its host galaxy and uh, if it's really well localized, its direct environment, to see whether it's you know, consistent with um, certain progenitors. Now, the first two one-off FRBs to be localized were strikingly found in environments that were similar to uh, short gamma ray bursts. And so this kind of prompted 
um, this study that I led back in 2020 um, to see, you know, now that we have this host galaxy information, we can have a, a more accurate um, energy budget because we have that redshift information. Let's see if we can go back to those models that um, I described in the previous slide and see if we can actually start, you know, placing constraints on them. So this is what we do in the paper. And uh, in particular, what we demonstrate is that ultimately, in order to make meaningful constraints, you're really going to need additional information. You're going to want the help of multi-wavelength, multi-messenger information. Um, and ultimately, if you're going to want to connect these two phenomena together or indeed rule them out, you're really going to need additional uh, information. So for instance, you know, uh, the merger uh, radio afterglow uh, that I mentioned uh, um, uh, in the first part of my talk. Uh, or possibly a radio counterpart associated with um, a magnetar wind nebula, for instance. Of course, gamma rays for a, a GRB association, um, um, and of course, gravitational waves. So the next question is then, how do you actually go about building up this joint FRB multi-messenger multi-wavelength um, sample? There are a few ways that you can go about this. Um, one approach is just to go searching in archival data. As I mentioned, FRBs are, are not rare. In fact, uh, you know, a, a huge catalog was, was published um, not too long ago that included hundreds of FRBs. And so you can actually start comparing uh, those sorts of catalogs to existing uh, like GRB catalogs. Uh, some people have played the same game but doing uh, sub-threshold gravitational wave searches. The limitation there is that uh, the distance horizon, again, of, of gravitational wave detectors and compared to the distances out to which FRBs are typically uh, detected. Um, but I think in, in a few years' time, uh, this, these sort of searches should, should really be um, uh, provide a conclusive answer, I think, about uh, uh, whether these two are, are associated. Um, you could play the same game, uh, but doing subthreshold searches in um, Fermi GBM data. So Fermi has a wide field of view, and you could actually um, go a lot deeper than the sort of uh, catalogs that are published um, if you do targeted searches at a particular point in time and at a per particular location. So this is what um, I'm showing in this plot here. These are the sort of subthreshold search limits for the two FRBs that we investigated. And the reason why these limits are so wonky is that the sensitivity is highly dependent on the relative position of the FRB and the, the detector. Um, moving forward, I think there are some upcoming radio uh, surveys that um, should be an interesting um, uh, data set to look th for uh, associations with um, neutron star, uh, sorry, with um, FRBs. So you can look for, you know, orphan radio afterglows and see if you can connect them to, to FRBs. Again, you need like large numbers of, of both. Um, and then you can also do the same sort of thing in upcoming uh, optical catalogs, for instance. A completely different approach would be a, a proactive one, right? So I mentioned those two indicators that we use to tell us that a neutron star merger has occurred, short gamma ray burst detections or, or gravitational waves. So you can say, given that I know that one of these has just occurred, given that we've just detected one of these, let's point our radio telescope to the position of um, these uh, transient events and see if we can catch any associated radio emission. Now to do this time is of the essence, right? I showed that kind of um, uh, the overview of models and, and, and many of them, you know, you might miss them if, you, if you're not on source within a, a few seconds. Um, so you really need uh, telescopes with, with a low um, latencies. And for this, um, uh, radio interferometers are, are, are best, right? Because they're completely electronically steered. You don't have to rely on mechanical slewing. Um, in theory, you should be able to get on source within a few seconds. And indeed, LOFAR's, LOFAR and the MWA um, has been uh, going after uh, short gamma ray bursts in particular uh, to catch associated radio emission. Now, you'll notice that LOFAR's response time is, is not as, as fast as it, it probably ought to be. Um, we're hoping that that's going to be improved with uh, the LOFAR upgrade. Hopefully, we'll be able to get that down to a minute. But nonetheless, we've been observing uh, short gamma ray bursts um, with LOFAR for the past few years. And this is, um, uh, I'll walk you through what we're sort of looking for in, in these particular observations. So this is a, a gamma ray burst light curve. In the black data points, you have your gamma rays. And then in the blue data points, you have your x-rays. And so you'll see in the x-ray light curve, there's um, uh, a sort of plateau, right? There's signs of, there's a, there's a flattening there. And this is indicative of energy injection. And, and one of the um, explanations for this um, is uh, that it could be driven by, you know, a magnetar remnant. And so what we're, the hypothesis that we're testing with these observations is can we uh, test the presence of this putative magnetar remnant through any radio emission that it is uh, producing? 
And so you'll see that our LOFAR observations, uh, which are in that shaded red region, are overlapping this plateau phase. So we're, we are where we want to be for the, that particular sort of model. We're not fast enough at the moment to get on source for those pre-merger models, for instance. Um, and so um, this kind of goes back to what um, LOFAR 2.0s um, uh, will, will deliver in terms of uh, improvements to this project. So currently, our observations are only, our, our rapid response observations only allow us to record interferometric data. So this means we're only able to produce a two-hour image. And so this means we're able to put deep limits on persistent emission, pulsar-like emission. But if you have, you know, a magnetar flare, you only have like a, a flash of radio emission, that's going to be buried in your two-hour observation. There are some tricks you can do. You could chop up your data, for instance, but really that's not the, the strategy you want when you're um, going after FRBs. And so with this LOFAR upgrade, we'll be able to actually observe in high time and frequency resolution mode and be able to, you know, search for FRBs um, um, uh, in, uh, you know, in that, that really um, high resolution data set. And so I think this will be an incredibly powerful tool uh, moving on to, to 04 when, when, the, when LOFAR turns back on. Um, so yeah, I think I'll close with a, a few more slides um, just because this is a little bit tantalizing and, and fun. Um, so uh, I, I've been advocating for these joint multi-wavelength uh, multi FRB data sets, but there's actually one model, the pre-merger model, which um, I think you might be able to, to potentially rule out uh, with FRB data alone. Um, and those are those pre-merger models. Um, and this is because the energy reservoir that's available to you is a strict function of the orbital separation of your system, right? And you can actually solve this analytically using you know, whatever uh, kind of specific model uh, you choose. Um, and this is shown by those black solid lines there for you know, a BNS or a BHNS. And you can compare this directly to the light curve of your FRB. And so if the rise time is, for instance, too steep or, or too shallow, you can say, well, this is inconsistent with you know, what you would um, expect for these pre-merger um, models. So we demonstrate that for those two FRBs that we investigated uh, back in 2020, the, the first two one-offs to be localized. Um, but in a recent paper that, that we've submitted that's, that's on the archive, this is a paper that was led by um, Alex Cooper, a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam. We take this a step further and we say, you know, obviously not only are, you know, the, um, orbit, is the orbital separation uh, decreasing, but of course it's an orbit, right? So we're probably just going to be seeing pulses. Um, and you can actually model what these pulses are going to, you know, what this light curve is going to look like for, you know, various different model configurations. And that's exactly what's, what's shown here. So you can imagine if you have, um, you know, a large sample of FRBs, which we are, you know, beginning to collect. Currently, they're sampled at, you know, millisecond resolution level, but certain telescopes are going to be publishing uh, large numbers of FRBs at sub-millisecond resolution. So if you have hundreds of those, you could imagine, for instance, um, comparing them, their, their light curves, to a, a template bank of these sort of pre-merger models, which I think is kind of a, a fun, uh, fun little project. And to, to end things on, a, on an exciting note, um, Chime, which is uh, an FRB finding machine in, in Canada, um, has found uh, a few FRBs that are consisted of subbursts, and these subbursts have uh, a periodic separation, right? So one of the explanations that they um, entertain is that you know this could be consistent with these pre-merger models. Um, now, ultimately, you know, I, I think you're going to need to be able to to really um, uh, convince. Uh, yourself and, and everyone else that, that you know, you've found a burst that's related to one of these pre-merger models, you're going to need, you know, additional information, right? You're probably going to want uh, an EM counterpart. Um, yeah, so to, to summarize, um, both coherent and incoherent radio emission is expected from neutron star mergers, coherent radiation yet to be, yet to be um, uh, determined. Uh, but LOFAR can probe both types of emission. Um, and in 04, hopefully, we'll be geared up to, to uh, probe both of these things. So I'll leave it at that. I'm going to ask a slightly provocative question, and I don't mean to, to, no, to okay. attack you, but, but uh, uh, the, um, for the, the first part of the talk, when yeah. you spoke about the incoherent radio emission, right? So we, it seems that we are either in a situation where if the source is 
reasonably close to face on, like it was for even the GW 1717 of 30 degrees of axis, yeah. we're still able to uh, see the um, radiation uh, that's um, you know, at higher frequencies, optical yeah. uh, uh, x rays, etc. Um, and at that point, of course, it's important to follow up at all frequencies, yeah. uh, but at that point, we don't really need to search for it in the radio, we're yeah. just following up a known signal, yeah. right? So it's a follow up uh, yeah. problem rather than a search problem. On the other hand, of course, I appreciate that uh, radio ends up over time spreading out more broadly mm -hmm. than, than some of these other uh, bands, and so at late times, if it's, if it's a really off-axis source, you might, radio might in fact be the best bet, uh, but then it's going to be yeah. still weak and still at very late times, and uh, where the, with large air boxes associations, temporal associations yeah. are much more difficult because it's coming only at late times. So is there ever really a situation where we should be thinking of radio yeah. as a finding um, yeah. tool rather than a um, follow up on something else that was already yeah. discovered uh, in other bands? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. It's a very valid point. So I think there are certain situations where um, following up in, in optical could be challenging, right? There could be, you know, um, dust can, extinction could be an issue. Um, the sun can be an issue, right? So for, I think, 1708-17, had the event occurred like a month after uh, optical might have missed it, right? So I think that's kind of like the, the big push for, for radio. Um, now, I think there are other radio instruments that can observe, you know, uh, have a large field of view um, at higher frequencies, and you'd probably want to bet your money on, on that finding, you know, uh, in, an event over, you know, if you, if you had to choose between like ATCA or, or LOFAR, you'd probably, you know, go for, or sorry, ASCAP, you'd probably go for, for ASCAP. That is Southern Hemisphere. Um, but I also think that, you know, there, there's going to be events that, like the, the, this, this time that you're awarded is, is rather precious and there's going to be very large events. So I think there is room for, you know, um, multiple radio instruments with large fields of view to, you know, try to, to, to catch counterpart. Um, I think that the decision whether or not to follow up on your event and whether you're going to use, you know, this multi-beam configuration or a single beam is going to be a dynamic one, right? It's going to depend on how your collaborators are following up. The nice thing about observing at low frequencies is that you can wait, you, you have a little bit of time, right? You can wait and see whether a counterpart is found. If it's not, you can say, okay, well, why is that? Is, were there optical um, limitations? Um, so you, you have a little bit more time to, to be responsive and, and try to develop the, the best kind of response strategy. Um, the other thing I'll mention is for black hole neutron star mergers, we don't know what the optical, like you might not get oh, you, a killing over, right? I don't know if how likely that is, probably not, uh, if it's plunged right into the, to the black hole, right? Well, the um, it plunges in, you probably don't get any. You probably don't get it. Well, if you get a, yeah, I don't know. If you get, a, a, at what point do you not get a relativistic jet? I, I don't know. <laughs> Right, and then you might see uh, the afterglow from from the jet. So these are all kind of we don't really know. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your your question. Yes. Cool. Okay. Are there any more questions? So, so I, I seem to remember that there was some uh, suggestion that FRBs are recurrent, but as you see, some sure. some locations where they appear. So how does it work? They try to pick up as a merger, how can this merge again? Yeah, yeah, so repeating FRBs, yeah. So I, I focus my talk on uh, FRBs related to, to merger events, but I'm interested in FRBs in general, so I can definitely talk to you about repeating FRBs. So there are, there, there is evidence now for two different populations. I could talk about this in great length. So um, from a rates perspective, if you compare the rates of, of FRBs to the rates of, of possible progenitors, there aren't enough cataclysmic um, uh, progenitors to account for the FRBs that we're seeing, even the ones that are just observed as one-offs. And this implies that most FRBs need to repeat. Most of them do. So indeed, this is like just probing uh, a specific kind of scenario where a small fraction, even a small fraction of uh, FRBs uh, have a neutron star merger origin. Absolutely not most of them can be explained from a, a neutron star merger origin. Um, are you aware of the repeating FRB that was discovered that was localized to M81, globular cluster? So this uh, is... I just heard that, some, uh, that some, some of the repeating, which was yeah. at the time some breakthrough because the, uh, 
because it, it uh, meant that something different has to happen and just that adversity events. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, like most... That's not the way I think that. Yeah, so m most of the explanations for those are like, you know, they're probably related to, to neutron stars doing doing uh, weird things or magnetars doing weird things. Um, what uh, their, their progenitors are is still up for debate. Whether they have common progenitors are, are still up for debate. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're localizing them, repeaters as well, and they seem to be found in a variety of different types of, of host galaxies and environments. And this is uh, suggesting that uh, FRB, you know, sources can be found in a variety of different environments and have different progenitors, which is interesting. Observationally speaking, the bursts of um, the, the phenomenology of the bursts of repeaters and one-offs or observed one-offs are actually quite different. Uh, so this is, again, suggestive of two different classes, which is quite interesting. But still plenty of like, research to be done in the area. We, ne we need more localizations. It's early days still. So in the other part of your talk, you mentioned low files in the northern hemisphere, so it wasn't really good for setting your own team. Are there any prospects for coming to the southern hemisphere or building another one? Well, uh, I mean, MWA I know is going to be following up on uh, gravitational wave events, but I think they'll be going off after the prompt emission, just you know, from a sensitivity perspective. So I think they've actually, um, I think, demonstrated like some some pretty nice strategies. So um, for prompt emission uh, at low frequencies, the MWA is going to be going after them. In terms of low-frequency follow-up uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, besides that, I, well, in Australia, I'm, I'm not as much aware of, um, but at, you know, L-band. This the, is from, from a very, you know, non-expert yeah. view, like, low far is like a bunch of sticks in, you know, <laughs> so it feels easy to build. Yeah, I mean, like, MWA is like the, the low far uh, counterpart. There's also going to be SK low eventually. Um, so I guess that that's you know in the next I don't know I don't know what's the the, the current time estimate for that, but that that would be like the future um, kind of uh, next generation LOFAR instrument. LOFAR is the, the the like a what do they call it Pathfinder instrument for uh, SKA low. Okay, sure. Um, so GL seventeen actually had a remarkably simple spectrum, right? Uh, that across all the frequencies from radio to X-rays, yeah. right? You basically had more or less a, a single power law. Yeah. So, uh, if if that is actually generic, right? Then then we might uh, for uh, afterglows of W star mergers, right? Then we might say that actually it doesn't really matter what what frequency band you're following up at. You're not learning anything new from a different frequency band, <laughs> right? So yeah. so that's the problem with the question. You know, do we, do we expect that? Do we expect to see more features and, and interesting yeah. things happening from other frequency bands? That's a good question. I think, yeah, we were all in the same spectral arm. Like I showed that kind of simplified uh, spectrum. I would imagine that if we were to see an event, and I don't know how you know how many events we have to wait for. That's less off, less off axis. You're probably more likely, you know, you're going to see the um, emission earlier, and then you have a better chance of probing uh, different uh, spectral arms, right? Um, so I guess it remains to be seen. Um, I guess the, the benefit of observing at, at lower frequencies is you can. Uh, constrain the location of the synchrotron self-absorption frequency. I don't know how how interesting that is. I'm not a, a theorist, so uh, I guess that would provide information about the um, you know local environment. To what extent you know that is interesting for I don't know like ten events or something like that. I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, but I, I think uh, yeah, I think a, a, a more a different orientation might lead to a different uh, afterglows.